Hello, everyone. I would like to thank uh, Drs. Langer and Garen for inviting me to speak today at the Personalized Therapies and Thoracic Oncology virtual meeting. And I thank all the organizers for making this such a um, pleasure to do a virtual meeting seamlessly. I will be discussing immunotherapy in non-small cell lung cancer as it relates to specifically frontline therapy. I'm uh, Dr. Charu Agarwal. I'm the Leslie Heisler Associate Professor for Lung Cancer Excellence at the Abramson Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania. So today I will be talking to you about frontline therapy as it relates to immunotherapy. However, I think before we proceed on to my talk, I would just like to highlight the significant advances we have made, to, uh, we have made in the management of non-small cell lung cancer. Here is an article from New York Times from last year that demonstrated that cancer death rate in the United States dropped significantly. In fact, in a single year uh, between 2016 and 2017, we saw a, a decrease of about 2.2% in cancer-related mortality, which was largely driven from lung cancer advances. And on the right is a recent paper from New England Journal of Medicine that shows the trends and incidence, as well as incidence-based uh, mortality in lung cancer uh, in the United States states over the past several years, starting from 2001. As I, and as you can appreciate, there has been a consistent decline, uh, whereas survival has continuously increased. I would also like to highlight that these data probably capture the advances in targeted therapy that started in about um, 2011, 2013, as you can see uh, with this check mark with the first availability of EGFR uh, TKIs, and I like to highlight this here is because highlight this here because we are just starting to use immunotherapy over the last few years, and I'm confident that over the next five to ten years we'll continue to see significant improvements that will be garnered not just by advances in targeted therapy, but also spurred by an accelerated approval of a myriad of immunotherapy agents as well as combinations that we have today. So speaking of uh, agents that are available, we have several different agents and management of non-small cell lung cancer uh, is becoming increasingly complex. Here I show you just a snapshot of what our NCCN guidelines look like, uh, specifically for uh, patients that don't have a targetable mutation and have a PDL1 expression of 1 to 49%. And we never had this many options for non-small cell lung cancer, and you could see it's mind-boggling in terms of uh, should we use monotherapy, should we use uh, a doublet, should we use a triplet, or should we even be thinking about a quadruplet? Before we go into various clinical trials and dissect this data a little further, I would like to just put in a plug that testing for molecular markers remains paramount. So before we commit a patient to immunotherapy or chemoimmunotherapy, we must ensure that they don't have a targetable alteration where they may receive benefit from targeted therapy instead. Unlike other solid tumors in non-small cell lung cancer, PDL1 testing still remains quite important, and some of our management decisions uh, are still um, hinged upon PDL1 expression. There have been several new FDA approvals, uh, some of them within this year alone, and this is a slide. Um, that I borrowed from Dr. Karen Kelly uh, that's displayed here, which shows you the number of approvals that have come through, um, starting with the initial approvals of pembrolizumab in October 2016, based on the Keynote 24 trial. Um, this was followed by single agent approval of pembrolizumab uh, based on Keynote 42 trial. And then we also saw approvals of combination therapy based on Keynote 21 as well as Keynote 189. Most recently, we saw approvals for doublet immunotherapy based on the Checkmate 227. And these are the most recent approvals from May 2020, where nivolumab and ipilimumab were approved, um, as well as approved in combination with chemotherapy based on the Checkmate 9 LA data. Uh, 
It's important to also highlight that recently atezolizumab uh, garnered approval for use in patients with PDL1 greater than 50% based on the Empower 110 trial. And before this, atezolizumab had garnered approval in combination with chemotherapies uh, or targeted therapies based on the Empower 150 and Empower 130 trial. Squamous cell cancer should not be forgotten. There is a specific approval for uh, use of combination chemoimmunotherapy in patients with squamous cell cancers based on the Keynote 407 trial, something that we've been using in our clinics for the past year plus. So as you can imagine, there is increasingly available options and increased complexity. But I would like to just go back and really begin where it all started uh, in the first line setting. So this was really a paradigm changing trial. Keynote 24 was a first line trial that evaluated the um, utility or efficacy of pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy in patients with untreated stage four non-small cell lung cancer that had uh, PDL1 expression of greater than or equal to 50%. Patients could not have an activating EGFR or ALK um, mutation. Patients could not have brain metastases and no active autoimmune disease um, were required as an entry criteria. 300 patients were randomized to receive either pembrolizumab at a flat dose of 200 milligrams every three weeks for two years or platinum directed uh, platinum doublet chemotherapy based on histology. Primary endpoint for this trial was PFS, and we first heard about these data at the ESMO meeting in 2016. Overall survival was a secondary endpoint. And here you will see that the response rate using pembrolizumab was much higher in this patient population that was selected for PDL1 greater than 50%. We saw a response rate of 45%, um, with uh, a 28% response rate seen in patients that received chemotherapy. We saw significant improvements in both progression free survival as well as overall survival, as depicted here, with hazard ratios of 0.5 for progression free survival and 0.6 for overall survival, leading shortly thereafter to an FDA approval for patients that have greater than 50% PDL1 expression that were treatment naive. Again, I think this uh, really set the stage for upfront use of immunotherapy in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. This was followed um, later by the Keynote 189 trials evaluating triplet or chemoimmunotherapy versus chemotherapy. Very similar patient population. These patients had to be untreated stage four non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer without EGFR or ALK alterations with good performance status, um, no symptomatic brain metastases, and about 600 plus patients were randomized to receive triplet that that incorporated pembrolizumab, again, at that flat dose of 200 milligrams with pemetrexid, 500 milligrams per meter square administered every three weeks. And there was investigator choice to use either carboplatin at an AUC of five or cisplatin. Four induction cycles were administered, followed by maintenance using both pembrolizumab as well as pemetrexid. The control arm received uh, the same chemotherapy combination and maintenance with a placebo instead of uh, pemetrexid. And there was an option to cross over to pembrolizumab at the time of progression. Again, this was designed at a time where we already had data to support second line use of immunotherapy, be it nivolumab, atezolizumab, or pembrolizumab in the second line setting. Here we saw overall survival data um, at AACR in 2018. And as you can see in the intent to treat population, hazard ratio was 0.49 with a significant improvement in overall survival uh, for patients that received the triplet with a median overall survival that not, was not even reached at the time of this uh, data, data presentation. We saw, again, that response rates were higher with the triplet at about 47.6%. And we saw that overall survival by expression level of PDL1 um, didn't really matter. We saw that overall survival was improved across all uh, different expression levels, but perhaps the degree of improvement was highest, as you can see here in patients that had PDL1 greater than 50%, with a hazard ratio that was even more impressive of 0.4. Two. So 
you know, about 600 patients. Um, I would like to highlight that the PDL1 expression categories on this trial were very well balanced, mirroring the usual prevalence in clinic of about 33 to 34% um, in each of these categories. And we had never seen a hazard ratio of 0.49 in a frontline non-small cell lung cancer trial that was not using a targeted therapy. And we saw benefit across all subgroups with the response rate highest in the PD L1 high with a response rate of about 61.4%. Of course, when these data became available, we had already uh, seen data from Keynote 24. Um, and therefore, there were cross trial comparisons that were called into place uh, with Keynote 189 displayed on the left, um, showing data specifically for PDL1 greater than 50% expression and Keynote 24 on the right. And as you can see, overall response rate with the triplet was slightly higher at uh, about 61% compared to 49% with uh, pembrolizumab single agent. But it's important to highlight um, that at the time of this cross trial comparison, when Keynote 189 had just been um, released, we had much longer follow-up on Keynote 24, and it looked like that the two-year landmark survival was much higher at 51%. We now, of course, have much longer survival, and I'll go into these uh, data a little bit more in detail. It's worth mentioning that Keynote 42 also evaluated pembrolizumab in the frontline setting versus chemotherapy, albeit in a very in a slightly different patient population. This did lead to pembrolizumab approval, and I think it's worth highlighting some of the uh, drawbacks and some of the highlights of this trial. Again, untreated, locally advanced or metastatic non-small cell lung cancer with a PDL1 expression of greater than or equal to 1% were included. Rest of the enrollment criteria were very similar to Keynote 189 as well as Keynote uh, 24. And there were much uh, higher number of patients. Squamous histologies were allowed and patients were randomized to receive again, either pembrolizumab flat dose every three weeks for two years, or histology-specific chemotherapy using carboplatin. Primary endpoint was overall survival um, in TPS greater than 50, 20, as well as 1% populations. This was presented at the ASCO meeting. And here is the data at first blush. In patients that had TPS greater than 50%, pembrolizumab far exceeded um, performance compared to chemotherapy. Here you will see a hazard ratio of 0.69 compared to chemotherapy. Um, and in greater than 1% or greater than equal to 1%, we still saw somewhat of an overall survival improvement. However, the hazard ratio was not that significant coming in at 0.81. The p-value was still significant. Uh, however, there have been uh, critiques that the overall survival in, in the um, in the comparator arm uh, perhaps was less than expected and no crossover was allowed for these patients. Um, here's the overall survival for the middle of the pack. They won to 49%. We did not really see a clear advantage for these patients. So in summary, you know, majority of these patients, about 47% of the patients on this trial had high PDL one expression of greater than 50%, perhaps that drove the majority of the benefit that we saw uh, on this clinical trial. Again, remembering that the usual prevalence for these high PDL1 expressors is about 33%. Hazard ratio for um, overall survival for greater than 1% and the 1 to 49% was in the 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 range. Again, maybe not really justifying single agent pembrolizumab use for these patients, at least not based on this uh, data alone. But regardless, based on this clinical trial, pembrolizumab did become available um, for use for PDL1 greater than or equal to 1%. Based on Keynote 42, again, cross trial comparisons were uh, brought into question. And here I, I would like to pull back uh, my initial slide comparing Keynote 189 and 24 here and really transpose Keynote 42 here looking at uh, TPS greater than 50%. Here the hazard ratio was 0.69. Again, largely mirroring the experience that we've had with pembrolizumab single agent that yes, I mean, this is an active agent for these high expressors. And the two-year landmark survival here was about 44.7% versus 30% with an overall response rate of about about 40%, again, a very good option for patients that have high PDL1 expression. 
What about squamous histologies? Keynote 407 was a trial that specifically evaluated a triplet regimen in patients with squamous non-small cell lung cancer, largely mirroring the uh, trial design of Keynote 189 that was presented at AACR in 2018. This was presented shortly thereafter at the ASCO annual meeting. And you will see that pembrolizumab was combined with carboplatin with either paclitaxel or nab paclitaxel for a total of four cycles in the induction setting. And pembrolizumab single agent was continued for the experimental arm for a total of two years. And uh, this was replaced by a placebo in the standard of care arm with an optional crossover uh, at the time of progress progressors for patients in the um, standard of care arm. Here again, we saw significant improvements in overall survival for patients that received Pembro plus chemo. Hazard ratio was about 0.6. Uh, benefit was seen across all PDL1 stat uh, expressors similar to what we saw in Keynote 189. Very large trial, about 559 patients. Again, I think a very well-balanced trial. PDL one expression largely uh, mirrored the clinical prevalence of about 33 to 34%. And you know, a hazard ratio, again, of 0.64 in squamous cell, non-small cell lung cancers um, was actually a wel welcome relief for our patients with this histology. And given that the benefit was seen in all subgroups, um, this led quickly to its acceptance. And um, we started using this very quickly after these results came out for our patients with PDL1 less than 50%. Um, I would like to highlight a few other clinical trials that have been approved, mainly in non squamous, non small cell lung cancer, using atezolizumab, which is a PDL1 inhibitor in the frontline setting. Empower 130 uh, was a clinical trial that again enrolled patients with non um, uh, or treatment naive non squamous, non small cell lung cancer. Any PDL1 express expressors were allowed, and four to six cycles of induction chemoimmunotherapy were utilized on this trial using carboplatin plus NAB paclitaxel in combination with atezolizumab, followed by atezolizumab uh, maintenance. And this treatment could continue until an investigator assessed loss of clinical benefit. There were co primary endpoints of uh, PFS as well as overall. Uh, um, survival in the intent to treat population. And then there was a key secondary endpoint of overall survival and PFS in intent to treat population and by PDL1 expression. Atezolizumab was administered at a dose of 1200 milligrams every three weeks. And here are the data from Empower 130. Uh, we saw again the similar. Um, sort of signal that triplet, chemo, uh, triplet uh, chemoimmunotherapy led to an improvement in progression-free survival, again, with a hazard ratio shown here of 0.64 and translated into an overall survival benefit with a hazard ratio of 0.79. Here you can see the one-year and two-year landmark overall survival percentages with the triplet of 63% as well as 40% respectively higher than what we would expect with chemotherapy alone. Safety profile of atezolizumab plus chemotherapy was consistent what, with what we would expect with individual uh, monotherapy, and there were no significant um, new uh, safety signals that were noticed. Again, this led uh, to uh, uh, approval of this regimen and is now included in the NCCN guidelines as a treatment option for patients with treatment-naive, non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. Empower 130 um, looked at building upon the previous regimen of carboplatin, paclitaxel, as well as bevacizumab, uh, which used to be our preferred regimen before pemetrexid uh, was widely used for non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. But really, they asked the question, can adding immunotherapy uh, to um, a bevacizumab and chemotherapy backbone improve outcomes even further? Uh, this was a large trial. Recurrent non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancers were enrolled, about 1,200 patients that were randomized into three different arms. Arm A uh, included atezolizumab with chemotherapy, that is carbopac. Arm B included both atezolizumab as well as bevacizumab 
with carbopack, and arm C, which was the control arm or the old arm of carboplatin, paclitaxel, or bevacizumab, all treatments in the induction setting were administered for four to six cycles, and they were followed by maintenance therapy as outlined here. In arm B, atezolizumab and bevacizumab were both administered as maintenance, and all patients received treatment until progressive disease. Uh, patients were also followed for survival follow-up. And here are the results um, of the overall survival of arm B, which is the quadruplet arm which is versus the control arm C. And here you will see an improvement in overall survival, both at 12 months as well as 24 months with a hazard ratio of about 0.78 with a p-value that was significant. Um, this did have uh, a tail to the curve, although not quite uh, far away from uh, the control arm. However, there are patients that have been reported to have longer follow-up. What's important on this trial is that arm A versus arm C did not seem to be that different. So if you look at uh, the Atezo plus Carbopac versus the Bevacizumab plus Carbopac, the hazard ratio was less impressive at 0.88. Uh, and this, uh, or these are data from um, the time point where uh, the trial had a median follow-up of about 20 months available. Speaking of other combination uh, clinical trials, so I discussed with you Pembroke Lizumab single agent. I talked to you about triplet chemotherapy. We also saw data from, from quadruplet uh, immunotherapy incorporating bevacizumab in the Empower 150. But what if we were to think about a chemotherapy-free approach? And um, most recently at the ASCO meeting, we saw data from Checkmate 227. And this is uh, you know the three-year update. So long-term follow-up was available on some of these patients. Um, this is a complicated uh, trial design to say the least, and many of us have seen this trial presented in different iterations before. Uh, but let me refresh you um, and walk you through some of the data from this three-year update. Stage four or recurrent non-small cell lung cancer with any histology were included if they did not have an EGFR or ALK mutation. Patients could receive either NEVO plus IPI or chemo or NEVO if they had PDL1 expression greater than or equal to 1%, or if they had PDL1 expression less than 1%, they could get NEVO, IPI, chemo, or NEVO plus chemo. And at this year's ASCO meeting, we saw updates on the uh, NEVO plus IPI versus the chemotherapy arms. And here are the baseline characteristics of this part one analysis. Um, baseline characteristics on this trial for this part one were well balanced across the treatment groups, including NEVO monotherapy as well as NEVO plus chemo. And here you can see the percentage um, distributions of patients uh, based on PDL1 expression, with about 70% of the patients having greater than or equal to 1% expression. We saw that overall survival with NEVO plus IPI was higher compared to uh, chemo or compared to nivolumab in patients with PDL1 greater than or equal to 1% with a median overall survival of 17.1 months. And 33% of these patients were living at the time of the three year overall follow up, as shown here. Also important to mention that patients less than 1% seem to have a benefit from nevo IPI as well, with an overall survival of 17.2 months versus 12.2 months with chemotherapy. Um, it's important to remember that nevo IPI is not currently approved as a combination therapy for PDL1 less than 1% at this time. Um, safety data are shown here. Um, I was pleasantly surprised to see that grade three, four treatment related AEs leading to discontinuation was only seen in about 12% of the patients, which is slightly lower than I would have anticipated for such a combination. Again, uh, stressing the importance of dosing and also following up and recognizing immunotherapy related adverse events quickly. Checkmate 9LA is another study evaluating a quadruplet, but using NEVO IP plus two cycles of chemotherapy. This was presented at the ASCO annual meeting. Very similar uh, trial entry criteria. Patients received every three week NEVO, NEVO every six week IP, and every three week chemotherapy only for two cycles. And the control arm received chemotherapy for four cycles with optional maintenance. Again, this trial also showed us that the quadruplet 
that Checkmate 9LA regimen um, had an improvement in overall survival uh, with an overall survival of 15.6 months versus 10.9 months with chemotherapy. This is approved as a regimen. However, we don't quite have the long follow-up uh, that we do with some of the other trials. Here you can see that overall expression by PDL1 expression level um, showed that this, this combination was active amongst all uh, different subtypes of non small cell lung cancer, and progression free survival was slightly improved as well um, 6.7 months versus five months for chemotherapy. Uh, overall response rate, uh, as well as duration of response are shown here. Uh, a disease control rate of about 84% was seen with this combination. And duration of response seems to be much higher with the quadruplet at 11.3 months versus five and a half months. Um, this quadruplet was pretty safe. And as you can see, grade three for AE is leading to discontinuation with the quadruplets was only 16%. Most common uh, treatment-related AE is more nausea, anemia, asthenia, and diarrhea. Again, things that we can manage very well and efficiently as we take care of our patients. Here are some of the treatment-related select AEs that were presented on this trial. And as you can see, most of these were related to chemotherapy-related toxicities like anemia, neutropenia, and alopecia. And we saw some skin toxicities as well as endocrine toxicities, which we can expect with immunotherapy. So based on these trial data, FDA approved nivolumab and ipilimumab uh, along with chemotherapy for first-line treatment of metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, regardless of pdl one expression, uh, really increasing the number of available options that we have now. And really, it's a question of how uh, do we incorporate these different combination approaches into our treatment paradigm. And here is uh, an algorithm that I put together that I would like to walk you through um, and, you know, sort of think about when we see our patients, what should we be thinking about? So patient walks in the door with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. Histology is still very important. We look at non-squamous or squamous. I'll talk about our non-squamous patients first. If they have a non-squamous histology, very important to test for EGFR, ALK, BRAF, ROS1. The beginning of this slide is slightly outdated. We now have seven biomarkers that must be tested that include RET, um, MET exon 14, as well as uh, NTREC um, mutations, uh, which all have targetable uh, therapies available. So these are uh, must uh, biomarkers that must be tested. If they don't have a targetable alteration in my practice, I still like to think about PDL1 expression. For my patients that have PDL1 expression greater than 50%, I now have two options. I can either use pembrolizumab uh, based on the Keynote 24 or atezolizumab, which was recently approved. I didn't show you the data, but it was based on the Empower 110 trial showing very similar um, outcomes to the Keynote 24 trial where atezolizumab single agent led to significant responses in this high specific group of patients that have PDL1 expression greater than 50%. What to do for patients that have less than 50% expression? And I think we have several different options for our patients that have non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. I discussed with you Keynote 189 uh, that incorporates uh, chemo uh, and Pembro. There is Empower 130 that incorporates NAB paclitaxel with uh, atezolizumab. We have Empower 150 that looks at quadruplet, carbo, pac, bevacizumab, and atezolizumab. We have Checkmate 9LA that has only two cycles of chemotherapy and nevo ipi. And then we have Checkmate 227, which is nevo ipi, sort of a or chemo sparing approach for patients that have a PDL1 expression of more than 1%. Any of these options are reasonable options and I think have to be weighed in terms of what patients want. Um, you know, alopecia is a significant concern for some of my patients and I, I may choose a pemetrexid containing regimen for those. Um, neuropathy is a significant concern for some of my patients, um, making me choose one regimen over the, over the other. And then also I think uh, disease burden, performance status, as well as overall, um, overall, um, 
conditions of the patients, including how sick they are, may dictate what we use. It's important to remember that these regimens can also be used for our patients that have pdl one expression greater than 50%. However, most of the time, um, I, in my practice, tend to use uh, monotherapy for my patients with greater than 50%. Similarly, if we were to do the same exercise for squamous cell uh, patients, you can see that our options include Keynote 407, Checkmate 9 LA, or Checkmate 227 for the specific group of greater than 1%. Uh, I have not yet used Checkmate 9 LA as I await further data, but I'm very intrigued at the option of using key, uh, Checkmate 227 in this chemotherapy-free approach for those patients that specifically ask for such an approach. So in um, summary, we have many approaches available, but there are still unanswered questions uh, in terms of what is the best maintenance therapy? What regimen should I start off with? And I think this uh, cooperative group trial called Insignia will answer some of these questions where patients with non-small uh, cell lung cancer, mainly non-squamous uh, non histology, will either receive treatment with pembrolizumab or um, uh, get combination chemoimmunotherapy followed by different either maintenance or second line approaches for patients that have a PDL1 uh, expression greater than 1% and may really answer our question of what do we start with, how many cycles, what do we maintain treatment with, and what, do, what should we use as our second line treatment. So in summary, immunotherapy alone or in combination with chemotherapy has been the standard of care for patients with wild type non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer as well as squamous non-small cell lung cancer over the past two to three years. Lately, immunotherapy combinations with NEVO plus IPI are now approved for first-line management as well as quadruplet regimens incorporating two cycles of chemotherapy. I can't stress this enough, but testing for molecular markers remains paramount. And pd one um, IHC is still important to make treatment decisions for patients that have wild type non-squamous as well as squamous non-small cell lung cancer. Biomarkers such as TMB may become important in the future. And I'll talk a little bit more about biomarkers in my talk looking at immunotherapy combinations. And ongoing clinical trials such as the Insignia trial will really help define further management. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present today, and I'm happy to take questions in our live session. Thank you so much.